gonna walk on water There is no need to swim We're gonna walk on water Just like Messiah did Brother, keep me up, keep me up Keep my eyes on yours Jesus, keep me up, keep me up Show me so much more Help me walk to shore Show me so much more My faith is here with you, you And this faith is strong and true, true I'm standing with you in the ocean I feel the waves, I feel the motion Take my doubt away The Holy Ghost scare the fear out of me Sometimes everything feels like a stab in the dark But I'm reminded that I have your heart Your heart This faith is strong and true, true. Standing with you in the ocean, I feel the waves, I feel the motions. What's up, Reveal Gathering? We're going to start it off a little bit early. As far as the timer is concerned, please stand to your feet. I'm happy to be here tonight. Are you? Amen. amen. Can I hear it? An amen. Amen, amen. We're here in the house of God, and as is customary, this is a place where we proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen. Check this out. I was reading this earlier today. At sunset, Luke chapter 4, verse 40. The people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each of them, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. Hmm. Interesting. Jesus rebukes the demons, does not allow them to speak so that they would not proclaim the truth that he is the savior of the world. Well, the time has come for him to be properly proclaimed and displayed as the Messiah. Amen. And tonight is such an event. Please bow your heads with me for just a moment. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for another opportunity to gather together, to sing of your majesty, to sing of your glory to invite you to take dominion and more of our lives than you previously had. 
I pray, Lord, that you would just bless the message tonight, bless the worship, bless our giving, bless everything that is done in the downstairs and the food and our fellowship. Lord, may you be glorified, may we be edified, and in all things, may you receive the glory that you are properly due, Lord Jesus. We exalt you and we invite you. Speak to us tonight through your word. Lord, we need a breath of fresh air, maybe a, a, a new new drink of the living water. We need to eat the living bread. We need to have nourishment for the soul that is within each and every one of us. We know that this soul cannot be satisfied with the things the world has to offer, so we come eagerly looking and expecting something from you tonight. I pray that you would provide that to us. And I know, Lord God, that you will not disappoint. We praise your holy name in this place. Amen. Amen.
God bless this worship that we lift up to God. If you have your Bibles, please open up to me to Deuteronomy. When I was told that we were going to start the Old Testament, a, a series and a, a study on it, the first thing that came to my mind was, well, what's the whole point of it? What's, let's break it down into parts. What's the point of the Old Testament? What's God trying to get across to us? And God put into my mind a few verses from Deuteronomy, and I'll start off from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. God says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Amen. And I know that this isn't the only one, so I'm going to ask you to turn to chapter 10 as well. Chapter 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Amen. One thing that God's trying to get across to us in this study is that he wants a better relationship with us. That's, you're going to see it over and over and over again. God wants a relationship with his people, and that's what he's asking for us. And these aren't the only two verses you're going to come across where this is, this is the main point. But in this prayer, as we set a basis for this study, let us set a basis starting in prayer where you go before God and say, God, I want a better relationship with you. I want to start, start afresh, start anew. I want to set some standards for myself that I am going to love you with this, with that, with my heart, with my soul, with my mind, just as you command me. God says, I require it of you, not I ask of you, not I wish of you. I require, I command. Let's go into this prayer. Let's be, be conscious of what you can pray, guys. Don't let your mind flow to the side. Really concentrate on what you're praying. Set a true basis, set a true foundation of what this study is going to be. And let's get real with God, guys. Get real with God. Get straight. Be upright. And let's set a foundation of prayer. God, I want a relationship with you. Just like you require of me, I want to start that today. So let's, let's take this time in prayer and let's just pour it out to God. Be real, be honest. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross, for his goodness and his grace and his never-ending mercy. And this posture of being aware of how good God is, uh, won't you open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3, verse 14 and 15. Let's still our hearts and hear the word of the living God. The Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and thus shall you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And then you don't have to open there. You can just look at the screen. 2 Corinthians 1, 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. Amen. If you want to bow your heads with me as we pray. Holy Spirit, we need you to show up tonight and move. We're on the end of three weeks of prayer and fasting as a community, two weeks of persisting for a move of your Holy Spirit, God, and we don't believe that the work is completed. We believe that you have more to do. We ask you tonight that you would pour out a fresh anointing over each one of us, over me as I go to speak the word that you would deliver the gospel through me, Jesus. That these words would not be my words, but that they would be Holy Spirit anointed words. That they would be transformative, prophetically direct. And that you would teach us and reveal to us what it is that you want us to know. If there's hearts that have not yet met you, that need to know you, I pray that tonight would be their night where they would meet you for the first time. I pray that you would plant seeds that would blossom and grow and produce fruit. And that when we're done tonight, that everything that would have been completed this evening would be for one purpose and one goal, and that is to make much of your holy and mighty name, King Jesus. So together with one voice, we say amen, amen, hallelujah, amen. Have a seat, everybody. Amen. Amen. I I always ask the same question, so I hope your guys' volume is ready to go. Uh, Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord? I love it. You guys were ready. You were on cue. Praise the Lord. Um, welcome to Reveal, everybody. It's uh, to echo what Gabi says. You made the best decision to be in the house of the Lord tonight. We are Reveal Gathering at Philadelphia Church. We are one body, one group, one family, one people who gather together on Wednesday nights to worship Jesus in song and in prayer. And then we sit under the teaching of the word of God. And we, we believe that the Holy Spirit speaks. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. And then because he speaks, we are a people who receive the word and we respond in prayer and in song and in fellowship. And so we're just so glad you get to be here. And if it's your first time here or if it's your first time in a long time, please come and grab any one of the leaders. We'd love to get connected with you. Uh, or just go and say, hey, I'm new here. You want to be friends? You, you never know how you'll make a new friend. But the point is, don't leave tonight and just come and go. Like, get plugged in. Be a part of this. This is not a statement. This is a movement. The Holy Spirit is at work here. Amen. 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 I'm excited to announce and to intro our new sermon series for the year. It's called History or His Story. Uh, this is uh, our biggest goal yet. And uh, by God's grace, we'll be able to do it because God is with us. But our goal, should the Lord keep us in life, is to look at the entire Old Testament narrative arc for the year of 2023. It's going to be our biggest sermon series we've done, but I believe it's going to be a fruitful and a beautiful one. We've prayed, we've fasted, we've butted heads over this, surely enough. (laughs) 
<laughs> but uh, that's how you know it's good, you know. There's been opposition from the enemy over this. I, I can testify to that. But I believe that the Lord has a beautiful and a good thing planned for each and every one of us in and through this series. And so I want to just launch us with an opening thought, which is this. What do you think about God? Gabby. All right. Richard. Sovereign and king over all. Abriella. What do you think about God? A.W. Tozer has this incredible quote. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. There's not one particular right answer because God is multifaceted and at times we might think of more of his sovereignty. We might think of his healing at times. But what we think about God is the most important thing about each one of us. And so I'll ask the question again, and I want to frame it this way. What do you think about God? And I want to follow it up with this question. Why do you think that way? I make a statement and ask a question. Why do you believe X about God? And you answer this. This is what I think about God. Why? And it might be because of an experience or you've heard a sermon or a prophetic word or anything. But at the end of the day, the derivative of all those line items is what you believe about God is revealed to you through the word of God. So really the question is why you think that way is because you understood something from the Bible that way. Which then naturally flows to this next question. What do you think the Bible is about? And as we were challenged to prepare this series for the Old Testament, we met and we met, and challenge after challenge, and the idea was, what is the grand narrative arc of the entire Old Testament? What Andrew said earlier was incredibly prophetic. You know, like the Old Testament is all about one thing. What is that one thing that the entire Old Testament is ultimately about? What you think the Bible is about informs us what you think God is about. And I want to ask another question. What if you're wrong? How would you know? I want to frame this even more. Gabi, what do you see? Future preacher, <laughs> Future preacher come on. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'll receive that prophecy. Um, Alex Tanisha, what do you see? A fireman. Okay. Annalise, what do you see? Grace, what do you see? Samson. That's my son, Samson. He's three years old yesterday. He just turned three. It's pretty cool. It's his birthday. Uh, yeah, you can clap. It's great. He's not here, but yeah. <laughs> so we see uh, a firefighter suit. He has a whistle. He has his hat on. And uh, this picture was actually taken right after he threw this at his older brother, Luther. Uh, so <laughs> it's not with him at the time. Uh, And then normally a part of his outfit is this axe. We see that. Because for the most part, we're adults. And we can look objectively and say, that's a firefighter suit. And that's my little boy. To Samson, though, and Luther, who have incredibly creative minds, that whistle is actually called the songer. Now, the songer, what you do with the songer is you go around and you make noise. You blow into the whistle and you make a song, which alerts the other brother that there's a bad guy there. Now, the firefighter suit that you see is actually not a firefighter suit. That's called a laser suit protector. -er. I'm not making this up. This is what my kids call them. So we see a fireman suit and they see a laser suit. Their helmet is a protector from the bad guys. And this, this is the most magical of them all. This is an axe, right? And they see it sometimes as an axe, but for Samson in particular, this is a hose. This is a laser cutter -er. This is a bad guy getter -er. 
and a million other things that I forgot because they're so creative. My point is, to us it's one thing, and to them it's something totally different. And so making sure we have the narrative right matters. Because if, if I'm telling you this story, right, about my kids, and, I, and we objectively look at this and say, this is a firefighter suit, we, according to him who's telling the story, are wrong. His narrative, his story, my son's story, is what I just said. And every single one of us in the room would be wrong. And so making sure that we get the story right matters when it comes to the word of God. We can't go into it with our own presuppositions and assume to come to the correct conclusions. And like it, you don't like it, each one of us carries an element of presuppositional thought as we approach the word of God. We are Western-minded thinkers with Western philosophy who are so far removed from ancient Near East upbringing and theology that we read the text oftentimes things that it never meant to read to us. And so getting the story right matters. Perspective matters. And so as we launch into this new series, we really have to have some basic questions answered. Number one, who is writing the story? Can they be trusted? Where do we begin? Why are they telling the story? Who's telling it? Can they be trusted? Why are they telling the story? Or what's the whole point? And so as with any story, let's go at the very beginning. Who is writing our story? Who's writing the word of God? What we know from the scripture is that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So our author and our grand narrative of his story is God. Are you with me so far? God is our author. He's the one penning everything, and it is good. Now the next question is this. Can they be trusted? Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. Can God be trusted? The answer is yes. And I want to pause here for a second because I feel like trust in a story sometimes is incredibly critical. Uh, this may not make much sense to some of the younger crowd, but maybe Alex and Richard and Gabby and everybody else will understand this. Get this. I have a friend, and uh, we talk about the good old days. And my friend goes... Yeah, I used to bench about 400 pounds. And uh, we're like, no, no, you did not. Not even close. Don't even embellish. It was not even close, you know. Or another friend is like, yeah, I was at this party, and I talked with, like, so many girls. And then we're all like, we were at that party, man. Nobody talked to you. You know, like, that's not how the story went. Or maybe a little bit more plainer for us is... Um, I don't know if any of you guys have that friend who is like, yeah, I have a girlfriend. She just goes to a different church, so you wouldn't know her. No? None of you guys do that? Yeah, me neither. Uh, my point is, trust matters. So God's the one writing the story. Our follow-up natural question is, can God be trusted? Can we trust that what God is telling us is the truth, infallible, inerrant, perfect, without flaw? And the answer is 100% yes, without a doubt. And so then the next question is, what is the story of the Old Testament? What is his story? What is the Old Testament about? Moreover, what is the grand narrative of the Bible all about? How should we read it? How do we apply it to our lives? Is the Old Testament, do we read it to find fun, VeggieTale-themed stories on how to live a better life? Do we read the Old Testament to learn morality? And that's it. Is the Old Testament a handbook on how to be a Republican? Is the Old Testament a narrative arc that when you guys become parents, you're going to beat your kids with it so that way they can be good old boys and girls? Or is there something deeper to the story? What is the story all about? Is it a moral compass? Is it philosophy? What is the narrative? What is the story? What is history all about? And as all good stories, they have a beginning. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll take it from the top. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who's telling the story? Who's telling the story? God. 
right? Who's doing the creating? Work with me here. God. Perfect. We're on the same page. God's doing the writing. God's doing the writing. God's doing the creating. When is he doing it? In the beginning. Great. When is that beginning? It doesn't say. That's the beautiful part about it, so let's not think about that. Quite literally, the Hebrew word for in the beginning means way back when or a long time ago in the galaxy far away. I'm just joking. That's, that's not in the text, I promise. No. But literally, this would have been a story that would have been passed down from generation to generation because, again, Moses is the author of the actual like, text that was written down, and Moses was not around when Adam was around, was he? So this would have been an oral tradition story that would have been passed down from generation to generation. And so in the beginning would have been, hey guys, a long time ago, God did this. And so what does God do? He created the heavens and the earth. Amen. What does he create? Let's look at it. God creates, is it formatted good? Great. So in the beginning... And I'm not going to go through all the in-betweens, but there's this beautiful, poetic level of creation where God has seven beautiful statements of let there be and it was good, let there be and it was good, let there be and it was good, let there be and it was good. Just over and over again, this beautiful poetry where God is just speaking and things were happening. God spoke and it was. In poetic, beautiful majesty, let there be and it was good. But what does he create, and what do we infer from there? God creates time, the universe. He creates the seas and the sky, and then he creates dry land and vegetation. Now, separate from that, or we can think of it almost as a way to fill those elements, God creates the sun, moon, and stars to fill the universe. He creates the fish in the sea and birds in the sky to fill the sky and the seas. And then he creates the land animals and humanity to fill the land. From there, what we infer, what do we draw from this creation narrative? We learn about the personality of God, that he is our king, that he is the origin of the universe, that there is order and complexity to it all. It's not just like randomly put together. It was created with complexity and order and precision. There's a solar system. There's an atmosphere and a hydrosphere. Sorry, flat earthers. Life. Mankind, marriage, and the introduction of good and evil. Now, work with me here. What's not there? Was it seven literal days or seven metaphorical days? How did God create the universe? Like, Did he speak and then somehow like the chemicals came together and then the atoms particulated? When he created the animals, was it a chicken or an egg first? Did he create the bones on the horse and then the sinews and then the nervous system and the everything? Like how did he do it? Is that there? Is that anywhere in the chapters of the creation narrative? No. There's no debate about details. I love how Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it. For we cannot speak of the beginning. Where the beginning begins, our thinking stops, it comes to an end. We approach the narrative so often, and we ask these questions that produce zero fruit. Literal, figurative, which is it? Is it, how did he put it together? What were the means? What were the methods? And we ask these questions that, if we were quite honest, like, let's, let's put ourselves back in the time of Moses and Aaron, and they're sitting around hearing this story, and it's like, hey, Moses, hey, Aaron, uh, how do you think God did it? No. Like, more than likely, what David, the psalmist, writes is probably what they were thinking. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? The point of the creation narrative is not how God did it. It's the fact that he did do it. One more time. It's not how he did it. It's the fact that he did do it by the power of his word and that's it. And so let's not get caught up in the in-betweens and the, well, was it this and that and these useless arbitrary conversations that lead to no fruit. The narrative arc, if God wanted us to know how, he would have told us. But God's right in the story. He's the one doing the creating. He didn't tell us. So let's not get caught up in the weeds. 
Rather, let's position ourselves in such a place where we can see, okay, it's not about how, it's about the fact that he did do it. The reader of the word would have been in awe and in amazement hearing this story. This person who we worship, who we interact with, who we can talk to and he talks to us back, he's the one who did this? They get down on their knees, prostrate, and worship him and say, I don't, I don't care how you did it. The fact that you did do it is sufficient for me. I want to hear what else you have to say. That's the point of the narrative arc of the creation of our universe, is that God was involved in making all of it, putting it together with order and beauty and precision. God help us. God help us not get so stuck in the weeds that we have meaningless conversations that take us nowhere. So the, set, the stage is set. We have our universe, we have the sky, we have the land, and then we go on, and then the next piece of it is we have the introduction to our first human. So God creates this garden, names it Eden, and he's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some people. I'm gonna put them in this garden, and this is what we see next. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So the stage is set. Creation is done. The earth is created. The garden is planted. The people are there. What do they do? God says, have dominion over them. Now, because we're Westerners, and our mindset is not within a proper monarchistic framework. Let's look at what dominion means. In English, when we say kingdom, we think of a geographical place, like an actual like, territorial place, like the kingdom of the UK or the kingdom of, you know, fill in the blank. And it's like these places. But to the Hebrew readers, they would have learned that kingdom is actually an action. So when we think of kingdom... To king or to have dominion is the rule or reign of. So God creates the universe. He creates the earth. He creates humanity. And he says, now I want you to be my king and my queen together with me. And we're going to rule over this place together. You have given him dominion or kingdom or rulership over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Pretty good story so far. God created, everything is good, it's beautiful, unlimited money, power, anything they wanted, like it was there. Everything was great. He had one job, Adam. He had just one job. Rule and reign. That's it, just rule and reign over everything. No, like you wouldn't get tired, everything would have been perfect. Just rule and reign. He had one job, Adam. The Lord God commanded the man. Adam, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely, what is it? Die. Die. There we go. So creation is perfect. Adam and Eve are in there, and God says, have at it. Whatever is here, establish it, expand it, rule and reign. I'm going to be here with you. Now question, do we have any insight into the passage of time between the fall and when God gave this commandment? I'll tell you the answer is no. We don't know. It could have been one year, one day, a hundred years, a million years, a thousand years. We have no idea. We have zero idea. So let's not try to insert what we don't know into the text. But rather, let's just let the text speak to us what it speaks. What we know is that everything was good. They had one thing to do, which was to rule, to be a king and a queen. The only thing you can't do is touch the, or eat the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. But introduced into our narrative is the serpent. Now, the Bible doesn't explicitly call the serpent Satan in this text. But in other texts with cross-reference, we can understand that this is the Satan. This is the great serpent of old. This is the wicked one. This is the one who would ultimately tempt Eve and cause her to fall. And it says that the word of God reads that the serpent was more crafty than any other animal. 
and let's just pause for a second. This isn't in the notes, but like, why is it that we get so caught up on silly things like the age of the earth, but we don't freak out when we see that a snake is talking to us? Just for free. Just put that out there. You know, like, let's not get caught up in the weeds. This figure, this Satan, the enemy, someone who was here, a wicked person, came to Eve. Said, did God, this is in Genesis 3, 1 through 3, and he says, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? What's the enemy doing? The enemy is challenging the narrative of God. God told the story. God gave the rules. God's the one who said, look, don't eat of this. And then immediately after, because the enemy is incredibly crafty and knows how to like push us, the enemy says, did God really say not to, not to eat of that? And then what does she reply? What does Eve say? She goes, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. How does sin enter the world? Through a challenge of the divine narrative. And through a mistake of not adhering to and being honest to that divine narrative. Did God say that Eve and Adam cannot touch the tree or the fruit? Anybody? No, not at all. God said, don't eat it. God's words were very specific. He said, don't eat it. Eve, in her own way, challenged God's narrative and said, yeah, God said don't eat it or touch it. The enemy had her. Immediately, he saw that she was weak. And, and I'm, I'm now this is where I'm presupposing, but I think logic would draw this. And he comes in and he says, no, 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 no. You, you won't die. You're not going to die if you, like, touch this. It's good. Like, God just doesn't want you to be like him. So immediately, the second we take our eyes off the grand narrative, off the true narrative, off the person who is trustworthy and good and who is writing this story because it's history, that's how sin entered the world. And we know what happened. She took of the apple and she ate it, and then they were naked and ashamed, and then Adam took of it and ate it as well, and then he blamed his wife, and God called her out on it. And he's like, the woman you gave me is the reason why I took of this. Always blaming women, guys, instead of owning it up for yourselves. Take some personal responsibility. That's just for free, putting it out there. So we're in this story where the narrative of God is challenged by the enemy. The woman and the man challenged the narrative of God and said, maybe he's wrong. Maybe our version of the story could be better. They take of the fruit. They sin. God calls them out. God calls them out and said, who told you you were naked? Because you've eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to be banished. And he has all of this, like, this is going to be really bad for you. This is going to be really bad for you. And then we come to this point where he addresses the enemy. And he says to the enemy, to the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So, in the narrative that we have of the word, where God told Adam, if you take of this apple, of this fruit, you're going to die. The narrative was challenged. They did what was wrong in the sight of God. Did God kill them? No. They're st obviously, they're still alive. The story's going on. So this isn't in the notes, but I want to just share with us just a taste and hopefully an ideation because I know that there's some who look at the Old Testament and say the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and there's no grace with him. I just want to encourage you and brother in Christ and sister in Christ, listen, if you think that the Old Testament God is a God of wrath, you're not reading the same story. Because we see grace in this moment. 
where God was telling Adam, you're going to die if you eat of this fruit, he does not kill them. And what grace is that? Don't let that pass you by. It's a minor detail that very quickly, very easily, you can skip over. Don't let it pass you by. There's this promise, bringing it back to where we're at. There's this promise that God makes both to Adam and Eve and to the serpent. And he says, I am going to put enmity, strife. There's going to be this opposition between you two, between your offspring and your offspring. And one day, the offspring of Eve and Adam will, the word there says bruise. In Hebrew, there's six times it's mentioned in the Old Testament, and five of those six, it's actually crush. The offspring of Adam and Eve will crush the head of the serpent. And the one usage of bruise in the Old Testament is actually bruise his heel. Because although Jesus died, he came back again. Amen. So there's a promise that somewhere along the lines, God's going to send someone who will crush the enemy once and for all. And defeat the enemy who caused them all these issues. Now, where are we at in this story? Look at Genesis 3, 22 through 24. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. How are we doing so far? Are you with me still? All right. So let's, let's put the story together. God created everything. It was perfect and good. He created the universe. He created the skies, the land. He created earth, the sea, the vegetation, everything in it. He plants a garden. He puts people in the garden. And he says, I want you to be a king and queen ruling over all of this perfectly without any issue. Sin crept into the garden through the accuser, through the enemy. And they fell. And they go from kings and queens to exiles. Kicked out of the Garden of Eden. From kings and queens to exiles. What is the story about? What is the narrative that God is teaching us through this creation account, through the Genesis story, and ultimately to the end of the Old Testament? Creation. Marvel that God is God and that he's the one who created everything and that he is perfect. It's not about how he did it. It's about the fact that he did do it. Marvel at it. Humanity. God created humankind to co-rule with him so that together they can establish a rule and reign over the earth and cover it with his goodness and with his grace. The enemy. There is an accuser who came to tempt and who will come to tempt and challenge this narrative over and over and over again. And then there is this promise that God will ultimately, through Jesus Christ, crush the head of the snake once and for all. And so if we were to say, what is the one narrative? What is the drama? What is the one story, the unified theme of the entire Old Testament? If somebody asks you, hey, what's the Old Testament about? What is the theme that you're going to hear over and over again over this next year is this is that all of Scripture, all of the Old Testament, is one unified narrative arc of redemption, pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ. So as you look at the creation account, as you look at Adam and Eve, as you look at Noah, Moses, and fill in the blank, all of it ultimately is pointing to the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. I want to wrap up tonight if the worship team wants to come on up. I want us to... Meditate on what this promise meant to them in their context. And then ultimately what it means to us in our context. All of scripture, all of the Old Testament is one story, one unified story, ultimately pointing to the person and work of Christ. Which means when we read the story of David and Goliath, 
the story is not limited to just David and Goliath and what it meant to them, but ultimately, how does that story fit the grand narrative arc of pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ? God's writing the story. It's his story. It's history. He's the one penning it and putting it together. From the judges to the prophets to the kings. It's one story pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And what we're looking forward to exploring as a theme throughout this next year is how it all fits together. And I pray and hope that God would draw our attention to that. Jesus is coming. Amen? So we, we, we read the text. We read the story that says that the offspring of the woman would crush the offspring of the enemy. And this was their promise, okay? So the promise is there's somebody coming, an offspring. Was it Cain or Abel? No. Was it Seth? Is Seth going to be the one who is going to ultimately bring about the redemption and, and crush the enemy once and for all? No. Is it Noah? Is it Samuel? Is it Moses? Is it David? Is it Ezra? Is it Esther? Is it Nehemiah? Like, we're going to read story after story and get a whole lot more in depth. But what we're going to see in each one of these stories is that as these figureheads are coming to fruition and there's hope, man, there's some stories we're going to read where it seems like the narrative is hanging by a thread. Like you think about Joseph when he's sent into slavery, like the entire people of Israel could have been wiped out because of the famine. But God in his sovereignty, through one thread that was left, carried the promise along. No, that snake's head's going to be crushed one day. When the people went into captivity in Egypt and 400 years of captivity, the people were crying out to God and it seemed as all hope is lost, the enemy won in that case. When is the offspring going to come to crush the head of the snake? And then Moses bursts out into the scene and parts the Red Sea with the power of God and then is that going to crush the head of the snake? Ultimately, no. And it's like theme after theme, story after story, we see this thread of like there's this buildup, there's this buildup, there's this buildup, and then the promise is like barely holding on. And God somehow makes the way. And, man, I want to encourage us tonight that all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. Like we, we look back and we're going to, I'm excited for this series. We're going to see week after week of story after story ultimately pointing to and culminating in the person and work of Christ. Like Jesus, when he came to live among us perfectly, when he died a death that if we died, it wouldn't make any sense. He was buried in the grave and took upon himself all of our sin and wickedness and shame. And then he rose again and, and we rise righteous with him provided we believe in him. When he did that, he crushed the head of the snake once and for all. And the battle is over. The war is done. He won. We win. This chapter of history, of his story, is completed and another one is opened up. All the promises of God find their yes in him who is Jesus Christ. And so the, the question for us tonight is this, is how do we fit into this narrative? I feel like sometimes we look at the Old Testament as a, as a series of stories and they're limited to that. And we're so far disconnected to them. But what if we paused and, and considered the fact that all of those stories ultimately pointed to Jesus. And then Jesus on the cross is the proof, is the ratification of all of those stories, that he fulfilled the promise. And let me ask you this, are there still promises from the Old and New Testament that apply to us today? Absolutely. Is God done writing history or his story? No. Or are we a part of that story yet to be written? I'm not sure who this is for, but I want to encourage you tonight that if there's a promise yet fulfilled, your faith is hanging on by a thread, you are not forsaken, you are not forgotten, you are a part of his story, and God's not done with you yet. If you want to stand to your feet, we're going to close out the evening in prayer and in worship.
my hope is that as we sing and as we pray, you would meditate on the promises and on the word of God. And that you would recognize that you are a part of his story and a part of history. And where there's a challenge of doubt and you're not sure, the encouragement tonight is this, is to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you faith to trust in his promises, to believe that he's not done with you yet, that he's still writing history, and that you are very much a part of it. Let's worship God together. Amen.
the beautiful thing is that one day that glorious day the creation every single person will bow down to the king will worship him and honor him every mouth will confess that Jesus that Jesus is the Christ he's the Lord the Savior my Savior your Savior and not only that but through this sermon series everything that will point to Jesus Christ amen is not my story is not your story hallelujah it's his story we have such a beautiful legacy and from now on is my responsibility and your responsibility to take this story bring it to your family bring it to the community to the church to the body of Christ everybody needs to hear the gospel the good news the story of salvation the story of creation the story about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ you know what many people many people actually they believe in a God you go to Muslim world they talk about and tell you God bless you they talk about God but this is our God the God of Abraham Jacob and Isaiah and you are God and my God and our parents God the creator of the universe and tonight as we brother Peter was preaching and the next sermon series I mean the next sermon we through our sermon series we want to worship him and glorify him that's why we as a reveal gathering as a family as a church as a body of Christ we will stay on that truth we will not shake we will not move we will not compromise we will not go back the only commission we have is this to go forward in the name of Jesus Christ he is the king we follow the king he is the Lord we follow our Lord he is our Redeemer we follow our Redeemer but not only that you and me we have our own story too share the story of salvation share the story of creation share your personal story the way you met Jesus Christ the way Jesus healed you redeem you restore you make you a new creation make him famous not me not you let's make Jesus known everywhere let's make Jesus famous let's tell the people in this world our story in conclusion tonight as I leave this place I will live more stronger in my faith saying that I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ I will not be ashamed of the story of creation I will not be ashamed of the story of redemption and I will be not be ashamed of my own story Heavenly Father we we come before you and we want to say thank you for blessing us with another day from the moment we woke up we felt your present we felt your guidance father god we thank you jesus we want to say thank you for for giving us the opportunity as a family as a revealed gathering to come here tonight in this place to glorify you to worship you to learn about you jesus christ we thank you and especially we pray for for 2023 as we start this journey of studying together the old testament we ask you in the name of jesus that this story of the old testament to change our life to change our perspective 
to change the passion inside us Jesus Christ to be more passionate about you seeking your face your presence Father God every single time we pray for the people who do not know you as Lord and Savior do not know you as personal relationship and they do not have a personal relationship with you Father we ask you that through the power of the gospel and through the power of the Holy Spirit change their mind and change their life make them a new creation and as they are a new creation give them the boldness and the courage to take their story to take your story to share with people around them we thank you Jesus we thank you for the worship team we thank you for brother Andrew Shalar we thank you for brother Peter Kutile we thank you for everybody who came here in your presence, Father God. We thank you for those people who connect with us online. Bless them, be with them, Jesus. And help us as we leave this place. As we leave this place, Jesus. To not be about us, but to be about you, Jesus Christ. As we're going to meet with our friends and family during the next couple of day, days, help us be a light. Help us talk about, talk about you, Jesus. And in our discussion and everything we do to glorify you, Father God. We thank you. We honor you. We love you. And all God's people say clear and loud. Amen. 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 Give it up for Jesus Christ.